So headship, it's kind of a weird concept, especially for people who aren't used to hearing that word in church. Really, we're just talking about who is in charge. Who gets to have the final say? Who has control over things? And so I'll start this morning with a joke. And this is a joke that a priest told me before we did a wedding together. It's just in the, in the little back room. These are the secret things that happen between pastors and priests, I guess. And he says, there was, there was this man, and he went to a country club, and in the country club, he was in the changing room area, the locker room, and the phone rings, and he looks around the room, and he says, guys, watch this. And he answers the phone, he puts it on speakerphone. And the woman says, oh, honey, I'm so glad I caught you. Remember that necklace I'd been telling you about. That one from the movie, the one I just really, really loved. It is on sale for half price. It is only $10,000 if we buy it right now. And he says, looks around the room. All the guys are like, oh, what's he going to do? Ten th- that's a lot of money. He says, buy it. For you, anything. She says, oh, honey, thank you so much. I love you so much. And you know what? Our friend from the car dealership, do you remember that Corvette? that perfect Corvette that i just been dreaming of driving in the summertime, the price has gone down to $50,000. We're never going to get it for less than that. What do you say? And he says, for you, anything. Of course, let's get it. And she says, oh, wow, I just love you so much. And do you know what? Remember that lake house we've been talking about? That one that was going for $2 million. I just talked to the real estate agent. They've dropped it to 1.5 million. I think we should get it. And he says, of course, sign the papers, let's get it. And she says, oh, honey, thank you so much. I love you so much. This is so great. I'll talk to you later. Goodbye. And she hangs up. And he holds up the phone. He looks around the room. Everyone's jaws just dropped. (gasps) And he says to them, does anyone know whose cell phone this is? Who is in charge? Who controls the the purse strings in that story? That that wife wanting to make sure she was running these very elaborate expenses past her husband, uh, only to find out that uh, she got all the answers she wanted from somebody else. Well, what we're going to do, this will be a little bit more old school. So we're actually going to, I have a Bible up here. I'm going to flip through some verses. I'm going to read some quick verses on headship because it comes through the Bible a bunch of times. And then we're going to look at three major verses. So the first one, if you want to flip through your Bible with me, or if you have uh, the Bible app on your phone, is 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. So we'll get to see how well I know the order of my Bible and, and how well this Bible has all of the verses still in it. Here, in 1 Corinthians eleven three, 3, we get a little bit of uh, something from Paul here on the order of headship. Huh. And by that, I must have meant 2 Corinthians 11.3. This is what happens. Nope, there it is. 1 Corinthians 11.3. If you have a pew Bible, it'll be on page 1,293. Uh, Whoever finds it first, raise your Bible, and then you'll get a prize later. And the prize is satisfaction of being first. So Paul says this. Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So we start to see from Paul, he's giving this hierarchy here. Uh, Christ is the head, but then we see this man-woman kind of headship thing going on. You know, what's, what's up with that? Well, So let's, let's read another passage in Colossians chapter 3. So that'll be a little bit further back in your Bible, a few chapters over, right after Philippians. Colossians chapter 3, so this will be verses, we're just going to look at verses 18 and 19 quickly. That'll be on page 1329. It says, wives, submit to your husbands in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So again, it's talking about relationship here, who's submitting to who, how we're supposed to do relationships. Uh, Wives, submit to your husbands, but husbands, make sure you're being loving to your wives. And if you read a little bit further, it also talks a little bit about slaves obeying their masters, which maybe should be a little bit of a hint to us that these are some cultural things that maybe aren't for all time. Uh, And and truthfully, this passage here, if you keep reading and talking about slaves obey your masters, this would have been used as proof that in America, we should have slaves. 
course, it's in the Bible. There's slaves in the Bible, so we should have slaves. That should all be okay. So we have to be really careful how we use passages and not just to dive in and take out what we want. Uh, you can also read later in Titus chapter 2, it goes through a whole bunch of this thing called a household co code. It's kind of this idea where how should we act, how should we live towards one another? What does it mean to be uh, a young man, an old man, an older woman, a young woman? How do we interrelate? That's all in Titus chapter 2. But we're going to skip through a little bit further in the Bible to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. That's really close to the end. And that will be on page 1357 in your pew Bible. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Obey your leaders. Obey me. No. <laughs> That's, so this is a passage also used in obedience and in submission. And I have heard it from a church I grew up, grew up at when I had some questions about stuff. I was wondering, this doesn't really feel like we're following Jesus here. Why are we doing these decisions? And, and I was told by the pastor there, well, the elders decide this. We have made this decision. You will submit to our authority and obey us. To which me being the good child who was raised on the Bible at that church. They made us memorize lots of things in Awana. Uh, you can't slip that one past me. And then I said, I thought we're only supposed to obey and submit to Christ. Uh, it would not be long until I was no longer at that church and they pulled my membership. But that's a different story for another day. Uh, talking about leaders being obeyed. So who do we obey? How does this work out? And we're seeing that the idea of headship, the idea of there being some sort of a hierarchy of submission is pretty normal to the New Testament and to the Bible. Right? That comes up pretty often. So that's going to take us to three major passages that I think will help us to understand this better. And that one, the first one will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So again, sorry that we're hopping through the Bible and I don't have it on the screen for you. Anybody there yet? Anyone, any winners? Any winners? 1 Corinthians 9, we're going to look at verses 19 to 23. That'll be on page 1292. And this passage says, this is uh, the Apostle Paul speaking, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law I became like one not having the law though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. This is an important passage because the all things to all people have you, have you ever heard that before, becoming all things to all people? It's important because it's talking about freedom. We have freedom in Christ, but freedom isn't the idea where we're free from things. It's not like we're just free from something before, but we're free to serve God. We're free with a purpose. And in, in Paul's writing here, he's saying, everything I'm doing, all of my decisions are all based around the idea that I want to serve Jesus and I want other people to come to know his love. It's all for the sake of, of the gospel, of salvation. The driving force behind everything Paul does in all of his writings and everything uh, that you read about him in the stories of Acts is for the sake of Jesus' gospel hope, right? He's going to put aside other things. What's least important? What's most important? Jesus. I'm going to focus on that. Those other things will fall to the wayside for Paul. So that's going to guide our understanding, too, of when we read the rest of what Paul's writing about because he is very much aware of what the culture is like. He's very much aware of what people need, what they expect in these different cultures where we see these churches popping up. And he's going to say, we're going to do whatever we can so that we serve Jesus, so that we bring about God's kingdom, love, and values here so that other people can join in with us. 
my Bible up here is actually falling apart, which is not a good sign. Uh, so we're going to look at Ephesians, which is what we had read earlier, chapter 5. So that'll just be two chapters further on if you're in 1 Corinthians. Oh, a couple chapters on. Galatians and Ephesians. Uh, now, I'm not going to go through reading all of that passage again. It is on page 1321. Um, so a little bit of background here. Culturally, this is the first century. This is the Middle East. This is uh, antiquity, the Roman world. And there are cultural expectations on gender roles. There's expectations for what women should be like, what men should be like, what young men should be like, what older men, and so forth. So Paul's trying to interact in some ways with what the ideals of the time are so that we can bring about the gospel message. So while in our society, we're very much at a place where we're moving closer and closer to a place where women are seen as equal to men. You know, it's not quite there in the workplace. We understand it's not quite there in the world. But that seems to be an ideal that we're moving towards. That is not the ideal that the gospel is written in. That is not the ideal of that culture. So in a lot of ways, he's trying to find ways that we can explain following Jesus, this freedom in Jesus, to a culture that saw women as inferior to men. And not only that, women were often seen as um, ritualistically or like religiously impure. There's a certain time of the month that comes around, and then if you, as a man who wants to be pure, you have to kind of shun the woman or the women in your life and not have them come anywhere near you because you don't want them to make you impure. Right? It's very much a blaming, well, they're the ones bringing the impurity, I'll just stay separate and I can be all good and pure. And when we read Ephesians chapter 5 here, we see it very interesting in, in verse 21. It starts with, I think, the key phrase, which is submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So everything starts with out of reverence for Christ. And then it'll talk about what it means for a wife to submit to her husband. And it also talks about the husband as the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, and how the church submits to Christ. There's this example that we see Jesus as the main example, as the one who has married the church. So us as this beloved wife of the church from Jesus. And so then when it says husbands, remember, you're supposed to act as Christ. You are the head. It is your job to do this. You're to love your wife. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her, result, bringing her forward without blemish, holy and blameless. Instead of seeing women as the people who would bring impurity into our lives, we're now seeing husbands as being responsible for the ones who are going to bless their wives and being responsible for the purity of their family. Uh, N.T. Wright says this about this passage, and I love this. He says, the church became the Messiah's bride, not by being dragged unwillingly by force, but because he gave himself totally and utterly for her. There was nothing that love could do for the Messiah's people that he did not do. The cross was an act of complete self-abandoning love. So the headship that we see here, wives submit to your husbands, husbands, you know, be, be kind, you know, you're going you're gonna to be the head of your family. So remember, that means you're going to die for the sake of your wife. You're going to lay down everything for the sake of your wife. It's very much taking what was the, the cultural expectation, that is the man in charge, women's going to go and obey, to being, yeah, you're in charge, but in such a way that you are going to serve with all that you are and do everything for the sake of the expected lesser in society. It very much subverts things. Now, when we read Ephesians 5 and we read this passage, in our society now, we kind of feel, well, that sounds a bit weird, right? Submit to your husbands. I don't know. But you have to remember, it's written at a time, in a culture, and with a purpose to point people towards living out the values of Jesus. And why is that? So that 
your neighbors when they look at your relationships. They look at how you treat your children. They look at how you treat each other as spouses. They'll look at you and they'll think, my ideal is that the man is in charge and the woman goes and submits to him. And when I look at that family, man, do they have things together. They're just so loving of each other. Their children never resent them. They, 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 they're just so wonderful. The, the husband never lords himself over the wife there. Oh, that's just so fantastic. They have something going on that I don't understand, and I want to learn more. It's this idea of our interpersonal relationships are a way in society of us living out our faith and sharing our faith with other people. They'll know you are Christians by how we love one another. That starts in the home. That starts in our interpersonal relationships. That does not mean that it is our responsibility as Christians to stay in relationships that are abusive or that are difficult. Right? That is different, it is to lovingly serve, but also there's a time to lovingly separate. We have to be careful because that can sometimes be a burden put on, on women. Another passage that I'd like us to look at uh, briefly is First Peter. Again, that's right near the end of the Bible. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. So this is coming from somebody else. This is Peter, who was a disciple. He was one of the apostles. And I'm going to read this, verses 1 through 7 on page 1364. He says, wives, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without talk by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should come from your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. And it continues, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner, and as heirs with you, heirs with you, of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. So Peter is dealing in some ways with some stereotypes here. We talk about uh, outward adornment. That's kind of what people did, right? We don't dress like that now. That was a way of showing that you're, you're really beautiful. He's saying, no, the Christian beauty is inward, and the whole point of relationship here is so that you can win your spouse over to the faith. It's for the sake of the gospel. Now, girls at that time were not as valued as having boys. Girls were sometimes seen as an undue financial burden on, uh, on the parents. And if you had a second girl, very frequently you would either sell them into slavery as a baby or you would abandon them on the garbage heap outside of town. That's not what the Jewish people did. That's not what Christians did during that time. In fact, Christians would go out to the place where babies were being abandoned, these little girls, and they would adopt them into their family. And very early on in the church, we actually see that there were more Christian women growing up in the church than there were Christian men. So what we're going to see is as they're being married, Frequently, they will be the one carrying the faith. Maybe they're being married into a situation where the husband does not carry that faith. Maybe they're at a place where a woman is the one who has converted and the husband has not. In antiquity, in this time, to be a good wife meant obeying your husband in his religion. Your religion should match exactly that of your husband. Whatever he does, you're going to go and convert to that. So if you are to be a Christian in a world that there's all these pagan things going on, all these weird things, you are immediately saying no to your husband's religion of choice, and that makes you a bad wife in society. That's how your neighbors would see you. So since that's how your neighbors are going to see you, Paul's saying, well, then you, or Peter's saying here, then you can act in such a loving way that your husband will notice this. Not just, not just will your husband notice this, your neighbors will notice you know, I thought she was a bad wife because she wasn't doing those religious things, but there's something about her commitment to this Jesus fellow that's just so different. And it's a way of hopefully seeing the husband 
you know, there's something about the way that you treat me. I want that. I want what you have. And that's why the, the, this later part here, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives, treating them with respect. If you as a man converted to Christianity, immediately, if your wife was a good wife at that time, she'd be like, okay, we're Christians now. The whole household will be Christian because the man converted. That doesn't necessarily mean she's had a personal faith connection. So you have to be gentle. Be kind to your wife. Bring her along in such a way so that she can go and start to embody the love of Christ in her life. So those are three kind of main passages. So some things that I think stand out to me from here, and I think affect the way that we live, some four, my four end points, which I may have uh, finally pieced this together this morning after Brett texted me to say there's a baby on the way. <laughs> First here is how we live, how we relate to one another, how we love each other matters. It matters to our Christian witness. How we treat each other as spouses, how we treat our children, how we treat our neighbors, it matters as witnesses because people see that. Uh, I used to frequent a, uh, a bunch of my friends, we went to different churches, and we would go, and we would frequent this place called Swiss Chalet, which is a restaurant chain in Canada, and we would go there, and we almost always had the same servers, and we treated them very well, and we always tipped really well. We had these same, and they would, they would give us free uh, pop sometimes, or free desserts, and one time we saw the pastor of one of our churches was there, and he was off in the corner, and we kind of talked to him a little bit, then we sat down, and the, these... Uh, these servers came by, these women came by, and they said, oh, you know him? We're like, yeah, he's one of the pastors at, at, at the church that we go to. And they say, oh, he's the meanest person that comes in here. They never tip anything either. He writes Bible verses for us. Do you think they want to go to church with us? <laughs> right? Want to go to see that pastor? Do you want to see? That's what Christians are like sometimes, right? We leave the, how we treat other people how we even tip, how we treat each person we come into contact with is a major part of our witness. What will the fruit of our life look like, the fruit of our relationships? The second thing that I think stands out is that sometimes there's cultural stereotypes, like they see at this time, the man's stronger, the woman's weaker, and they're being subverted in the Bible. So what cultural stereotypes of today is Jesus calling us to challenge and to subvert in love? What are the cultural practices around us that we're to, to resist and to live out a different way as we follow Jesus? Our third point here is Paul says he's trying to be all things to all people so that some might be saved. What does that mean for us? What does it mean for us to try to be all things for all people? What does that look like for us today? What do we need to give up for the sake of the gospel? What, what do we need to resist for the sake of the gospel? What do we need to hold on to for the sake of the gospel? How can we be those all things? How do we relate in that way? And the final question, and I'd like you to reflect on this yourself. Am I giving Jesus headship? Am I giving Jesus control? If I'm trying to follow Jesus, if I'm calling myself a Christian, a Jesus follower, is Jesus really the one in charge? Is Jesus and his way of loving what's guiding all of my decisions? Is it guiding how I think, how I live, and how I love? Because that is what headship means in the Bible. It's giving over authority to the one who dies for us and sacrifices himself for us, who loves us deeply so that we might go out and be free to love others in the same way. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are kind and that you guide us in your ways of love. Help us to see people as you see them and to love people as you love them and give us opportunities to share the joy of the hope that we have in you with our neighbors, our family, and our friends. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.